Uh, good afternoon and welcome to Rundle Moore today. I'm joined for this press conference by the Honourable Vincent Tarsier, the Minister for Police, Corrections and Emergency Services in South Australia, and of course the Commissioner Grant Stevens, who is also the State Coordinator during this major emergency declaration. A very positive announcement today. Before I make it, I've just got to take my hat off uh, to the men and women in South Australia Police, uh, the sworn officers, the protective services officers in South Australia who've done just such an outstanding job. Over the last 18 months, I think back to the bushfires uh, where they played such a pivotal role, of course, during COVID, and most re recently with Operation Ironside. What an incredible thing. Constantly keeping the people of South Australia protected. We have the very best police force in the entire country, probably in the entire world, right here in South Australia. And today's announcement is about providing more resources uh, to South Australia Police so that they can continue to do the excellent work that they do. 114 additional protective uh, security officers in the upcoming uh, budget. That takes it to a total of 168 since we came to government. And the good thing about this is it means uh, that South Australia Police can go back to doing exactly what they've always done. They can be freed up uh, from some of their uh, very onerous COVID tasks and get back onto the things are the tasks that are just so important to keeping South Australia uh, one of the safest places in the entire world. Yesterday was a great day when we were uh, named the most livable place in the country, the third most livable place in the world. We want to keep it that way. Uh, South Australia Police is a big, big part of that. And of course today, a uh, significant announcement regarding additional resources. I'm now going to hand over to Vincent Tarsier from the Police Commissioner and then come back to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Premier. Uh, as the Premier alluded to, over $23 million for 114 extra PSOs. Uh, of course, the uh, original 54 PSOs will be rolled over, taking the total to 168. Uh, when you also factor in uh, the 72 cadets that were also uh, put on earlier, it takes the total commitment in terms of extra officers uh, since early 2020 uh, to 240. So what we're delivering uh, more officers on the beat, uh, more resources for South Australia Police. What that means is we're giving them the resources that they need uh, to continue to do a great job keeping South Australia safe, protecting us from crime, protecting us also from COVID. We know, as the Premier alluded to, our South Australian Police are a world-class law enforcement agency. We've seen that this week. Uh, despite the challenges of COVID, what we've seen is the most uh, significant uh, serious and organised crime uh, operation in our state's history. They're doing a wonderful job and as Police Minister it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to help provide extra resources for SAPOL so that they can have what they need to keep South Australia safe. So it will certainly mean uh, more police officers on the beat, more boots on the beat and they'll be able to protect South Australia from COVID and also from crime as well. I now pass over to the Police Commissioner. Thank you, Minister. Uh, can I just say that um, we've made no secret of the fact that COVID-19 has stretched police resources uh, throughout our uh, entire response. Uh, we've had an important role in helping keep South Australia safe. This injection of additional resources uh, is very important to us at this point in time. It gives us the ability to return some of those police officers who have been doing an excellent job on our checkpoints and in our Medi hotels and in other COVID duties, the opportunity to go back to their substantive roles. Uh, that will happen as soon as we can re recruit and train the additional protective security officers and that's a program we have already established and are ready to pull the trigger on now as soon as this announcement's been made. So uh, the message is out there, if anyone's thinking about a career in law enforcement, uh, we have substantial numbers of positions for protective security officers and it's a great pathway into uh, uh, policing generally. So our encouragement is for anyone thinking about a career change, uh, leaving school, um, looking for short-term contract employment, then please uh, consider a protective security officer role. They are very rewarding positions. This announcement by the government today, uh, I think is an important part of the overall response to COVID-19 and it gives us the ability to maintain that high level of service we've provided to the community uh, right throughout the pandemic. What is the best case scenario of getting those boots on the ground, like 114 of them? It's a nine-week training program. So uh, given the fact that we have to uh, recruit these uh, candidates and put them through that process. Uh, we anticipate the first uh, courses of these pr protective security officers will roll out probably sometime uh, around September and uh, progressively roll out from that point onwards. As the Minister alluded to, uh, we have already been funded for an additional 72 police. 
some of those additional police have already graduated and we'll see courses graduating every month between here and January. So there will be a continual increase in resources moving forward from today. Is it enough? Uh, we've done the assessment in terms of what we need to safely manage the Medi Hotels, which is the principal role the protective security officers will be playing in this, in this COVID response. And that's, that's the number we require to deliver a safe, secure environment for Medi Hotels at this point in time. Well, the, uh, the QR check-in response was a, a very short operation that involved uh, a discrete group of police officers who were already doing COVID-19 duties. So uh, I think we got the benefit and the, the impact we were looking for from that operation where we saw uh, QR check-ins jump by about a million a day, which is a substantial increase and we've maintained that since that operation. I think people in South Australia have got the message. It is critically important to our uh, COVID response and people are doing the right thing. So there's no ongoing requirement for that QR check-in process. Uh, the other roles that police officers have been undertaking for, uh, for COVID-19 uh, may still be a requirement for us to do that. So we're quite happy with the 114 at this point in time, but we are always assessing our resource implications. So where will, what will it free up? What will it allow you to do more of? Well, we've, we've, over the course of COVID-19, we've been deploying between three to 600 police officers every day to COVID duties. Our goal is to return those police officers from COVID duties to the substantive policing duties they were doing before COVID-19 hit us. So we're not doing anything new or different. Uh, we're enhancing the level of service we provide to the community as opposed to uh, managing on the limited resources based on our additional responsibilities for COVID. Now, we need to find a balance here. There are some duties that must be undertaken by sworn police officers and uh, the nature of our deployment is, uh, needs to be dynamic as well. And a good example of that is the uh, reinstatement of our checkpoints on the South Australian Victorian border. Now, we have to do that quickly and it's not an obligation that we, we meet every single day and uh, we need to manage that with, within existing resources. So notwithstanding the fact that we do have this additional uh, group of 114 extra PSOs plus the 54 we've already been funded for, there will be times when we're going to have to divert other police resources to COVID-19 duties, but this is about a day-to-day -day proposition where we know that we have enough police resources to fulfil all of our obligations across the state. How I think that's a, a, a very good example of just how dynamic and agile we are as an organisation. Uh, we were able to balance our COVID-19 responsibilities at a time when we do have check border checkpoints in place and at the same time find sufficient resources from an intelligence investigation and crime scene investigation perspective to safely conduct Operation Ironside over the last few days. Uh, it's a testament to the police officers and other staff we have in SAPOL uh, of the commitment they make and the, and the small sacrifices they make in order to get the job done as, as well as they do. I think it's safe to assume that uh, as uh, Assistant Commissioner Harvey has said over the last couple of days, this is really the beginning of a long-term operation. Um, now we've scooped up the high priority, high value targets, uh, but there'll be further analysis, further intelligence work, and that will result in further arrests as we go forward in the days and months to come. I think it's safe to say that uh, uh, Operation Ironside has dealt a significant blow to the Common Chair OMCG and I think it's probably put a lot of other OMCG members and organised crime entities in South Australia on notice that we are there and I think they've got more to worry about than police and uh, each other in terms of intergang rivalry. I think they'll be bunkering down at this point. Are comfortable with the technology you've used, like as the lawyers might say, that it's obtained legally and when we do get the process? Well, uh, this is an AFP-led uh, intelligence operation and uh, the advice we've been provided is that uh, it was a lawfully obtained, lawfully obtained information through the, uh, a proper warrant. Um, clearly that may be tested in the courts, but uh, we're satisfied with the information we've been provided and uh, I think you've seen the results as, as, as a consequence of that information. Oh, look, I won't speculate on what might, might come forward, but uh, I think there will be a few people in South Australia, Adelaide particularly, who should be very worried that they may get a knock on the door, and that will be a polite entry. 
we've always uh, we've always uh, stated that South Australia is a very safe place to live, work, and do business. But I think we can say we're that much safer today because of the, the significant blow that was dealt to organised crime as a result of Operation Ironside between Monday and today. Uh, we've had discussions with SA Health, uh, Professor Spurrier and other key members of the, uh, the health group. And at this point in time, their advice is that we retain the current level of restrictions that we do have in place. Uh, there are still concerns about uh, COVID spread in Victoria. Um, so there won't be any changes at this point in time. Um, they have forecast that we don't envisage any changes before the end of the long weekend. Can it take to be a change? Is there a certain amount of days between, you know, As a basic threshold, uh, SA Health have communicated that they look for 14 days without any community transmission. Uh, there are some there is some flexibility around that based on uh, the nature of that transmission and whether or not they're able to identify the source. But as a very basic rule, that's what they apply. But there is a level of uh, flexibility that makes sure we're, cater we're catering to the changes in the community and balancing all of those things that are important to community, not just COVID-19. Uh, we have spoken with SA Health today and at this point there are no uh, restrictions being proposed for New South Wales or Queensland. Obviously uh, we are watching very closely. If we see uh, the number of high risk locations increasing or any evidence of uh, community transmission that may change our thinking but at this point in time there are no uh, no instructions that would see a, a set of restrictions for those jurisdictions. So advice, for, advice for people who may be taking holidays uh, The advice that I would give now is the same as the advice I've always given. Is you should be aware of what's occurring in the, the location you're travelling to. Check the health websites in those locations and be flexible with your travel arrangements because uh, as we've all seen, uh, COVID-19 uh, is very unpredictable. Uh, we can't foreshadow what's going to happen tomorrow, so you should be flexible in your arrangements and uh, be prepared to change those arrangements if you need to to get home. There's a quarantine operation going on at the moment with the cats coming in South Australia. Well, SA Health have done a, a, a very detailed analysis of the risks and what treatments can be put in place to safely manage uh, the arrival of the uh, Geelong Football Club members and uh, their transition to the Oval, performance in the, uh, the game and then returning to the airport. They're satisfied that the risk can be safely mitigated. S uh, South Australia Police play their part in ensuring the safe passage of those players and officials to the grounds, their security while they're there and then escorting them back to the, the airport. So I'm satisfied that, that it's a sound decision making process and uh, it's done with the best interest of the South Australian community at heart. Can you explain how stringent the conditions are for Geelong? They they're very similar, as I understand it, to the conditions that were in place for the Collingwood Football Club. Uh, I think we saw a, a, a very seamless approach to ensuring that we enabled the game to occur without presenting undue risk to the South Australian community, and that's what we'll expect to see with the Geelong Football Club. All I can say is uh, we do need to learn to live with COVID-19. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, the impact on the South Australian economy and community generally uh, suffers if we don't find ways to have these sorts of activities occurring. We are mindful of the risk and those risks are being seriously considered as we work through ways to make these things possible. Uh, it's not just football, it's every major event that happens in South Australia. And there's some press going on about sort of that 12 swimmers who couldn't come over here from Victoria, swimming Australia didn't sign up to the same. What, what do you understand? Uh, I don't have specific information on that other than to say that um, uh, there were some people participating in trials in South Australia who uh, there was some confusion or misunderstanding around the exemption process. I've been advised that they, they have been resolved, but I don't have specific information. There are 12 that Swimming Australia didn't, couldn't abide by this sterile corridor they're suggesting. So there's a few second tier of swimmers who haven't managed to get in. So uh, I don't have specific information about that, but I do understand there was some problem with some swimmers. Well, 
we're very keen to bring international students back to South Australia safely. They make a huge impact on our economy and ultimately on jobs here uh, in Adelaide and more broadly across our state. Uh, we put our plan into the federal government uh, almost two weeks ago, so we're hopeful of getting a response very soon. Uh, we know now that other states are following suit. Yeah, look, we've uh, put a huge amount of effort into this uh, application, this proposal. The federal government, via Minister Tudge, said there were two key criteria. Number one is it had to be above the weekly uh, cap, and number two, it needed to be signed off by the state-based uh, Chief Public Health Officer. We've achieved both of those criteria. It's in for evaluation. We're really keen uh, for a speedy decision because we know bringing those international students uh, back will um, significantly improve our economy, but also uh, make sure that those people that are considering signing up, enrolling, uh, put South Australia back on their list of potential ways or, or, or places to study. <coughs> No, as you would be aware, you know, there were some peak periods around this time last year where there was a very substantial number of police officers completely diverted uh, towards COVID. We've seen that number reduce. The advice that we've received from SAPOL is that we need an additional 114 uh, PSOs in South Australia. That takes it up to about 170 since we've come to government. That seems to be the right level and that's on top of the additional sworn officers that have been committed by our government. Is this a temporary commitment though? No. COVID no, this is more than $20 million commitment over the next four years. It's uh, re-resourcing uh, the overall uh, protective uh, security officers uh, force here uh, in South Australia. We think it's a really important complement uh, to the sworn officers within SAPOL. So there's a job beyond COVID? Absolutely. Well, uh, we uh, take our advice uh, from the Police Commissioner regarding the resources that he requires to keep our state safe. Obviously, there's been a huge additional uh, workload uh, for SAPOL over COVID and of course with the bushfires and with Operation Ironside. This now takes us to a new resource level in South Australia so that we can continue to have the best police force in the entire country. Well, it was a late night, in fact, an early morning for our politicians uh, in the House of Assembly. Uh, we finished at around 1.30, uh, a big vote for the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill. Uh, ultimately, the vote went 33 to 11. It now goes back.